live from WTVO Rockford and your home team. Eyewitness News at 5 starts now. Beloit police deal with a string of car break-ins over the weekend. Now they're asking for the public's help tracking down a suspect. Over the weekend, there were plenty of car thefts in the state line. We'll hear from local police on the best ways for you to keep your vehicle safe. And a festive locomotive is set to reach the state line next month. Organizers say it's all to benefit local food banks. Good evening, I'm Mimi Murphy. And I'm Eric Wilson. Police arrest a Wisconsin man accused of holding a woman against her will. Sunday night around 1030, Whitewater police were called to the area of South Janesville and West Walworth streets for a report of a woman needing assistance. Police say Jefferson Guzman Rodriguez held a woman captive for several days with a gun pointed against her head at times. The woman is an acquaintance of Rodriguez. He took off when police arrived. Today, Rodriguez was apprehended and faces a number of charges, including kidnapping and false imprisonment. A Rockford man's rushed to the hospital after a bar fight. Sunday, RPD was called to Victory Tap on Harrison Avenue for a battery. Police identified Scott Graham as the suspect. Investigators say he battered a 56-year-old man. That man was taken to a hospital. He is in stable but critical condition. Graham is in the county jail. He's charged with aggravated battery. One man is dead after a crash in Lee County over the weekend. Around 5.30 Friday, the Lee County Sheriff's Office was called to Tower Road near Green Wing Road and US 52 in rural Sublette. Deputies found a black GMC terrain off the road. The driver, Anthony Barna, was pronounced dead on the scene. Investigators are still looking into the crash's cause. Two Rockford teens are arrested, accused of stealing a car. Over the weekend, there were more than seven reports of stolen vehicles in Rockford. Four have been recovered. One of them was recovered in an alley near Grant and Custer Avenues. RPD officers identified a 16-year-old girl and a 15-year-old boy as the suspects for the car theft. The boy has been charged with unlawful possession of a stolen vehicle and criminal damage to property. The girl is charged with criminal trespass to a vehicle. She has been released from custody. The boy has been lodged in juvenile detention. In Beloit, police are searching for a suspect after several cars were broken into over the weekend. A picture of one suspect was taken on a ring camera. Police say he stole from several vehicles around the area where that picture was taken. Authorities are asking the public to call if you see any suspicious people lurking around your neighborhood. They also advise people not to confront anyone as suspects may be armed. As we mentioned, those crimes are part of a string of car thefts across the state line that has many people worried. Now law enforcement agencies are providing tips on how best to stay safe. Drea Baroni caught up with a local officer. And Drea, what did he have to say? Yeah, Eric and Mimi, car thefts and break-ins have been on the rise in recent years, but police say they have seen an escalation in the past few days. I talked with a local officer who, was, who has tips to make sure your car is not the next stolen. In the last few days, we've had several more reports of cars being broken into in a variety of different places in the city. It's not necessarily isolated to one area. Sergeant Ryan Flanagan tells me that there are two types of car thefts on the rise. One is typically a person who is just going through cars looking for loose change, any valuables that might be in it. And, uh, and then the other one has been... Uh, people that are going into cars to steal them. The common culprit of these thefts are young groups of teenagers targeting two specific brands of cars, Kias and Hyundais. Flanagan says he is working with surrounding police departments to track down the stolen vehicles. We've been dealing with kids anywhere from ages 12 to 17 is usually like the age range we're dealing with. I mean, we've been really good in uh, Rockford, South Bloy, Rockton, Roscoe, Janesville. All the agencies around us have been really good about trying to communicate out what's out there and moving around because they know they just go from one jurisdiction to the other and steal and then ditch them, steal and then ditch them. So we're recovering cars from Madison, Milwaukee, all over the place. Flanagan says there's a few simple things people can do to protect their cars. Locking your car doors prevents these people from getting into your cars. Uh, steering wheel locks. If you own any of those cars, we would say contact your dealership and find out whatever they can do for the ignition. He also encourages people to report suspicious behavior to the police. When you see abnormal stuff, then just give us a call. And if it's nothing, it's nothing. If it's something, then at least we were on top of it. So we always just tell people, you know, stay vigilant. Um, it's not about being paranoid. It's about being prepared. For more information on how to keep your car safe from break-in or theft, go to mystateline.com. Mimi?
All right, thanks, Drea. State officials are advising drivers to be alert for deer. October is the beginning of deer mating season, which lasts until December. Last year, there were over 14,000 deer-related crashes in the state. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources says deer are especially active at dawn and dusk, so drivers should remain aware of their surroundings. If a crash is inevitable, it's advised that you don't veer away from the deer. You could end up in the opposite lanes of traffic or off the road. As the temperatures fall, so do gas prices in the state line. Gas in the Forest City is sitting at $3.59 a gallon. It's around a 29 cent drop since last month and a more than 64 cent drop from a year ago. The national average is $3.55. Experts at Gas Buddy say additional declines in prices should be coming over the next few weeks, even with fighting in the Middle East. A festive locomotive is set to stop on the state line next month. The Canada Pacific Holiday Train will arrive in Byron November 26th. The half-hour event will take place on Tower Road near the high school. CPKC makes a donation to a local food pantry at each stop. Attendees are encouraged to donate food items. Since 1999, the Holiday Train has raised more than $22 million for food banks across North America. The U.S. House of Representatives enters its second week without a speaker. Coming up, the top Republican nominee pushes forward a vote some lawmakers think is too quick. After a little bit of a chilly start out there this morning and some cloud cover, we were able to see some sunshine did give our temperatures a bit of a boost, climbing into the mid and upper 50s, still below average. But we briefly see those numbers climb. Find out if we fall right back down coming up in your most trusted forecast a little later. You're watching Eyewitness News. Your home team with Eric Wilson, Mimi Murphy, Scott Leber, and Chief Meteorologist Candace King. Palestinian Americans are stuck in Gaza waiting to get to safety. They've gathered at the still-closed Rafah crossing that goes from Gaza into Egypt. It was shut down nearly a week ago because of Israeli airstrikes. That's the only viable way to get people out. Egypt's government refuses to open the crossing because of safety concerns. Meanwhile, Americans in Gaza say they're afraid for their lives and want the U.S. to intervene. They are supposed to be a developed country talking about the human rights all the time. I don't think this makes any sense. I mean, uh, we are only citizens. We are not fighting. We are not doing anything. We are just living here. And if you are, if you are want to implement the basic things that you were talking about, you should protect your citizens first. U.S. representatives are on the Egypt side near the Gaza border. They're trying to convince Egypt to reopen Rafah. The closure is also affecting the delivery of supplies. They've been piling up at the border. The U.S. House of Representatives enters another week without a speaker. Although Republicans have nominated Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio as their most recent nominee, Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson reports some party members think a push to elect him leader may be too early. Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan is pushing for a Tuesday floor vote on his speakership nomination. But even some of his supporters think that's premature. It's not necessary at this point. So, you know, we did it. We'd have cool heads prevail. Talk about it. Texas Republican Dan Crenshaw wants to avoid a multi round speaker vote like what happened back in January. Still, Tennessee Republican Tim Burchett and California Republican Mike Garcia believe when it's time to vote, Jordan will have the needed support. He is the second most favorite Republican. At some point, you got either critical mass uh, or you don't, and you go to the crucible on the floor and let the American people hear these conversations. On Monday, Jordan also picked up a key endorsement from House Armed Services Chair, Alabama Republican Mike Rogers, who said a united Republican Party will be stronger to fight President Biden's policies. Jordan needs 217 votes on the floor to win the gavel, so he can only afford to lose the support of four fellow Republicans. Uh, we want to reopen the House uh, and get to a place uh, where we can tackle the challenges that are in front of us. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries says there are talks of a possible bipartisan solution to the House Speaker if Republicans fail to pick their own. A bipartisan governing coalition that puts the American people first. Reporting in Washington, Rashad Hudson. We've got a dry start to this autumn week. Up next, Candace details the temperatures along with a chance for rain Wednesday. Now, 
your first worn weather forecast from Chief Meteorologist Candace King. Just a beautiful picture coming in on our SkyTrack camera looking north up the Rock River here over downtown Rockford. We've got some fall color really starting to pop as we've got moderate color here across parts of northern Illinois. Kind of another week or so we'll really see that peak. But the drier conditions and the drought conditions leading up to this point also having a little bit of an impact. So in some areas the color may not be quite as vibrant <clears throat> excuse me, as what it normally would in years maybe where we've had a little more rainfall. We've We've also had some beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Nettie shared this picture uh, a little while ago, in fact, of the sun rising one Tuesday morning. Just a gorgeous view there. And we've got a little frost that could be with us for tomorrow's sunrise. So just kind of a heads up with that, although I think the frost may be a little more on the patchier side. You have any weather photos you would like to share? Weather at WTVO.com, especially those fall colors. You know, the weekend wasn't too terrible of a weekend to get out, and I think this upcoming weekend should be fair fairly nice as well. Temperatures, while they've been a bit on the cooler side, we've had some sunshine following cloud cover early on. 56 our number in Freeport, Rockford, same thing in Monroe, 55 in Rochelle, and 58 down in Sterling. We've held on to that northerly breeze this afternoon. Winds will turn light as high pressure builds in. 56 for our weather watcher, Terry in Genoa, north wind at 6 miles per hour. Dew point temperature sits at 45. We'll see those drier conditions, or at least drier air move in as we hold on to a mostly clear sky. Now we could see a little cloud cover kind of increase late tonight, very early tomorrow. These are more higher based clouds, so depending on how fast those move in, that could, one, have an impact on our frost potential tonight, and then, two, keep our temperatures a little warmer. Right now, we do not have any frost advisories in place uh, yet, depending on the cloud cover and really how that develops over the next couple of hours. So we'll hang on to that patchy frost wording into tomorrow morning, partly cloudy for the afternoon. Winds will pick up from the west and southwest on Tuesday, and that'll bring us back into the upper 50s to right around 60 degrees. We've got some good days coming up for field work. As drying out here uh, from yesterday and today, depending on how those field conditions are. Tomorrow we've got another dry day and the breeze will help with that too. Most of Wednesday is also going to be dry, but there are some showers that come in uh, late in the afternoon on Wednesday, and then we've got some scattered rain showers there for Thursday, so it may not be a good day to get out in the fields Thursday afternoon. We've got sunshine out there as the back edge of those clouds really working to the east of us. Some higher level clouds just up to the northwest will try to filter in here over Overnight. And as I mentioned, that could limit any frost development as we look through the overnight and keep those temperatures up close to 40 degrees. Right now, have that 36. We'll see sunshine return tomorrow with a westerly wind back up close to 60 for tomorrow afternoon. A slow increase in some of the cloud cover Tuesday night, but still with that dry air in place on Wednesday. We've got more cloud cover, but rain showers should hold off until later into the afternoon and evening. And even that looks to stay on the lighter end. Thursday holds a better chance for some rain showers, but you're only looking at a couple tenths of an inch of rain coming up with that. So 65 degrees on Wednesday, a warmer day, 60 on Thursday, and then we'll briefly see those numbers drop back again by the weekend. But next week, there are some signs of those temperatures warming right back up, so we could go back above average going into the following week. It's kind of a little back and forth, or a lot of yeah. back and forth, I guess, but we'll take the up with the down. Thanks, Candace. Scouts in next with sports. He'll update us on Justin Fields' injury and Fields' status for this Sunday's game against the Raiders. Now sports with sports director Scott Lever. Justin Fields needs all the work he can get reading defenses, getting his timing and accuracy down. He might not see action, though, for a while. Yesterday, he dislocated his thumb on his throwing hand when he was sacked in the third quarter. He left the game and never returned. The x-ray was negative, but Matt Eberflus says there is swelling and Fields cannot grip the football, so Fields is probably out for this Sunday's game against the Raiders. There's no timetable right now, um, and uh, he's going to, uh, it's really going to come down to grip strength. And um, <coughs> natural swelling that occurs uh, with this injury, so we should know more um, at the end of the week. Um, is he going to play this week? It uh, looks to be doubtful uh, right now for that, but again, we'll see at the end of the week. Meanwhile, guard Nate Davis has also been ruled out for this week with a high ankle sprain. Well, former Rockford Auburn and fighting Illini standout Vidarian Lowe is getting a lot of action with the New England Patriots. 
Yesterday he started his fifth straight game for them. His first start a month ago was at left tackle. The following week they moved low to right tackle and he has claimed that starting job ever since. There's more Monday Night Football action coming your way tonight on WTVO. The 3-2 Cowboys take on the 2-2 Chargers. Kickoff will be at 7-15. One of this area's top high school football players has made his college choice. Sycamore junior Blake Goucher gave his verbal commitment to the Iowa Hawkeyes yesterday. Goucher was a standout receiver for the Spartans last year when they reached the state semifinals in Class 5A. This season, he's the Spartans' starting quarterback. He also is a standout on defense and safety. Goucher chose the Hawkeyes over Illinois, NIU, Kent State, and several other colleges. In baseball's playoffs in the American League, the Rangers lead the Astros 5-2 in the fifth inning. The Rangers already lead that series one game to none. Tonight, the Diamondbacks and Phillies will play game one of the National League Championship Series. The Kansas Jayhawks are the team to beat in college basketball this season. They're an overwhelming number one choice in the AP preseason poll. The Jayhawks returned three starters, and they added former Michigan center Hunter Dickinson in the transfer portal. Duke is second in the poll. Purdue is third. Michigan State is fourth. And Marquette is fifth. The Illini are ranked 25th. At Sports, we'll be right back. Even though temperatures stayed in the 50s today, it was a beautiful afternoon. The sun makes a it world makes a of a difference. Huge difference. Yes. It sure does. <laughs> yeah, d d even if you've got a little wind, I mean, it really made it feel kind of nice out there. Open up the window briefly, but with the north wind, kind of got a little cool in the house, so close it back up. But next okay. couple of days, you may be able to uh, open up the windows and kind of let things air out after the rainy stretch we've had the last couple of days in the cloud cover from the weekend. Our first worn interactive radar going to stay dry tonight. We've got a mostly clear sky, but there are some indications that we could see a little more cloud cover come in later tonight. If that is the case, our frost potential goes down. Right now I have some patchy frost in the forecast and temperatures down to 36. Up to 64 tomorrow, 65 on Wednesday. Chance for rain later in the day Wednesday. Better chance on Thursday. All right, thanks Candice. And thank you for spending some time with us. Stay safe.